I am Ted from Nerd Immersion, your guide to the realm of Dungeons and Dragons. If you remember that intro, how are your knees doing? Uh, I know it's the last part of the intro, but either way. What I'm here to talk to you about, sorry, I just haven't changed out of this costume from videos I was filming earlier, but not a problem. I'm here to talk about Uni and the Hunt for the Lost Horn, which is now available on D&D Beyond. This video is not sponsored, so we're going to just talk about it at high level. I don't want to spoil the adventure because I either want to, one, run it for some people, or two, play it. But there is, uh, I'll show you right now, I'll head over to D&D Beyond, there is a new adventure on there called Udi and the Hunt for the Lost Horn. It's an intro adventure taking the characters from the D&D cartoon on a hunt to find, I guess, Uni's Lost Horn. Um, but also you're playing as the characters from the cartoon. But the main reason I'm making this video is, one, to draw attention to this, if you didn't know, but also they list all of the characters' magic items, and we're going to look at all of them. So um, let's go ahead and jump over to D&D Beyond. So it says right here, Uni the Horn Unicorn is in trouble. The evil spellcaster Kellic has stolen Uni's horn for a fell ritual. If the characters don't stop Kellic, they'll be destroyed. Um, it's part of a year-long celebration of D&D and its 50th anniversary. The adventure is designed for four to six level four characters, and you have the character sheets for Bobby, Diana, Eric, Hank, Presto, and Sheila, all presented in young adulthood. The seventh character sheet represents Nico, a cleric from a different set of adventurers who recently tumbled into the D&D multiverse. Each player can choose one of these characters or provide their own. So, I mean, obviously, I would want to play it as one of these characters. But to get to this, just to show you, I went to Sources, right at the top of D&D Beyond. I went over to Featured Adventures, clicked View All, and then you could see all of the games. And I scrolled down, and right here at the bottom it was Uni and the Hunt for the Lost Horn. So... It does have a bunch of stuff like base rules, including a bunch of spell casting and things. But what we're here to talk about is the magic items for the the legendary, if you will, magic items. Hank's energy bow, Eric's shield, Presto's hat, and so on. That's what I want to see. And then also check out this new Nico character and what their situation is. So let's go ahead and jump to, is it under rules? No. Is it under creatures? Pre-made characters. Here it is. All right. Ooh, there's stat blocks, too. <gasps> Another video incoming. We have 2024 stat blocks for creatures we don't have in the uh, player's handbook. So here are all of our classic characters you'll remember from the cartoon. Bobby, Diana, Eric, Hank, Presto, and Sheila. And then also Nico here, the new cleric. So here is Bobby. We're going to kind of glance over his stats. He is obviously a barbarian with a downloadable PDF for his stat block, but he has his Thunderous Great Club. This is a new weapon here, folks, a new magic item, a great club, very rare, requires attunement. While you're attuned, your strength is 20, unless your strength is already equal to or greater than that. It deals an extra 3d8 thunder damage to any creature it hits, and an extra 3d8 thunder damage to objects it hits that aren't being worn or carried. It also has the following capabilities. Clap of Thunder. As a magic action, you can strike the weapon against a hard surface to create a loud clap of thunder audible to 300 feet. You can also create a 30-foot cone of thunder's energy. Each creature in the cone must succeed on a DC 15 strength saving throw or have the prone condition. Non-magical objects in the cone that aren't being worn or carried take 3d8 thunder damage. So you can basically make a loud noise or a cone that will knock people prone. And it also has Earthquake. As a magic action, you can strike the weapon against the ground to create an intense seismic disturbance in a 50-foot radius circle centered on the point of impact. Structures in contact with the ground in that area take 50 bludgeoning damage. Wow. And each creature on the ground in that area must make a DC 20 deck save or be knocked prone. DC 20? Wow, it's pretty strong. If that creature is also concentrating, it must make a DC 20 constitution saving throw or be have its concentration broken. In addition, you can cause a 30-foot deep, 10-foot wide fissure to open up on the ground anywhere in the area. Any creature on a spot where the fissure opens must make a DC 20 dexterity saving throw, falling into the fissure on a failed save or moving into the fissure's edge on a successful one. Or moving, or sorry, with the fissure's edge. Any structure or spot where the fissure opens collapses into the fissure. If this is what we're going to start to see for very rare magic items in the Dungeon Master's Guide, I'm pretty excited because this is pretty solid 
design here. Not only is it boosting your strength and giving you extra damage and things, it has a lot of cool, interesting utility uses as well. All right, so we have Diana here, who has the quarterstaff of the acrobat, playing a monk. It is a very rare quarterstaff, plus two to attack rolls and damage rolls. While holding it, you can cause it to emit green uh, dim light out to 10 feet, and either as a bonus action or after you roll initiative, uh, you can extinguish the light as a bonus action. Um, while holding the weapon, you can take a bonus action to alter its form, turning it into a 6-inch rod for easy storage, or a 10-foot pole, or reverting it to a quarterstaff. The weapon will elongate only as far as the surrounding space allows. So this essentially allows you to get a free, collapsible-sizing 10-foot pole. In certain forms, it has additional properties. Uh, acrobatic assist as the quarterstaff or in the 10-foot pole form. While holding this weapon, you have advantage on all acrobatics checks. While in quarterstaff form, uh, it has at attack deflection. When you're hit by an attack while holding the weapon, you can take a reaction to twirl the weapon around you, gaining a plus five bonus to your armor class against the triggering attack, potentially causing the attack to miss. This is once per short or long rest. This is essentially giving you a shield spell um, that's a once per short rest uh, shield spell, and then ranged weapon in quarterstaff form only. This weapon has the thrown property with a normal range of 30 feet and a long range of 120 feet. Immediately after you make this attack, it flies back to your hand. Again, super solid. Loving that. All right, Eric's going to have his shield. Should be the shield of the cavalier. Yep, here it is. It is a plus two shield in addition to the shield's normal bonuses and then has the following abilities. Forceful Bash. When you take the attack action, you can make one attack roll using the shield against a target within five feet of yourself. Apply your proficiency bonus and strength modifier to the attack roll. On a hit, the shield deals force damage to the target equal to 2d6 plus two plus your strength modifier. Okay, so it's adding in the shield's armor bonus to the damage. So, okay, so attack roll against the target... Um, and yeah, okay, so yeah, you're gonna, it's like a regular old attack just with the shield, and it deals force damage equal to 2d6 plus 2 plus your strength modifier, and if it's a creature, you can push it 10 feet away from you. If the creature is your size or smaller, you can also knock it down, giving it the prone condition. Oh, it doesn't, no saving throw. If you hit, yeah, you just get to shove them away period, regardless, no size, just automatic 10-foot shove, no question. And if you're your size or smaller, you can also knock them prone, no saving throw. It also has protective field. As a reaction, when you are an ally you can see within five feet of you is targeted by an attack or makes a saving throw against an area of effect, you can use the shield to emanate an immobile five-foot emanation originating from you. When the emanation appears, any creature or objects not fully contained within it are pushed into the nearest unoccupied spaces outside it. The attack or area of effect that triggered the reaction has no effect on creatures and objects inside the emanation, which lasts as long as you maintain concentration up to one minute. Nothing can pass into or out of the emanation. A creature or object inside the emanation can't be damaged by attacks or effects originating from outside, nor can a creature inside the emanation damage anything outside it. Once this property is used, it can't be used until the next one. That is ridiculous. It's basically wall an, an undestroyable wall of force, while smaller in size, that's activated as a reaction to a triggering damage, uh, attack or saving throw. When you're targeted by an attack or make a saving throw. Yeah, you basically are building yourself a five-foot emanation wall of force bubble that happens as a reaction to something, and doesn't even have the downside of being able to be dispelled or destroyed with disintegrate. Dude, that's nuts. So cool. All right, with Hank's energy bow. All right, it is a plus one. It's longbow or shortbow. Uh, plus one is made of magic, has no string. Each time you pull your arm back in a firing motion, a magical arrow made of golden energy appears, knocked and ready to fire. An arrow produced by this weapon deals force damage instead of piercing damage, which is great. Um, until it disappears, the arrow emits, uh, disappears after it hits or misses its target. Until it disappears, it emits bright light in a 20-foot radius and dim light in another 20, and has the following three properties. Arrow of Restraint. Whenever you use this weapon to make a ranged attack against a creature, you can try to restrain that target instead of dealing damage to it. 
If the arrow hits, the target must make a DC 15 strength saving throw or have the restrained condition for one minute. As an action, a creature restrained by an arrow can make a DC 20 athletics check to try to break the restraint. See, that's great because they don't get a freebie break of the restraint. They have to use their action. The downside is in 2024, it's no longer strength checks. It's now athletics checks, which might be better for the monsters, but either way. There's the arrow of transport. As a magic action, you can fire one energy arrow from this weapon at a target you can see within 60 feet of yourself. The target can either be a willing medium or smaller creature or an object that isn't being worn or carried, provided the object is small enough to fit inside a five-foot cube. The arrow teleports the target to an unoccupied space you can see within 10 feet of you. Oh, wow. Damn. These are these are really cool magic items. So you can just shoot somebody. Well, as an action, you don't even have to try to hit them. You just, as an action, pick somebody within 60 feet of you, teleport them to within 10 feet of you, or a small uh, or an object that isn't being worn or carried that fits within a five-foot cube. You can just teleport it to you. And lastly, we have energy ladder. As a magic action, you can loose a flurry of energy arrows from the weapon at a wall up to 60 feet away from yourself. Your arrows become glowing rungs that stick out of the wall, forming a magical ladder up to 60 feet on the wall. Wow, so just bing, bing, just make a whole bunch of arrows to make a ladder that you can climb 60 feet tall that lasts for one minute uh, before they disappear. These weapons are solid. All right, Nico, our new cleric here. Nico's magic item is Nico's mace. Oh, it's nothing crazy. All right. Requires attunement by a spellcaster. This mace has six charges and regains. Oh, holy cow. While you hold the mace, you can use it to cast summon celestial. Okay. Just giving it some. All right. Nothing too crazy. That one, a minor one. It's not even like a plus one mace. It's just a mace that lets you cast summon celestial, but either way. All right. Then we're going to have Presto. We'll have Presto's hat. Hat of Many Spells. Requires attunement by a wizard. Listening to this, Robert? Give it to me. Uh, while holding the hat, you can use it as a spellcasting focus for your wizard spells. Any spell you cast using the hat gains a special somatic component. You must reach into the hat and pull the spell out of it. Unknown Spell. While holding the hat, you can try to cast a level 1 spell you don't know. The spell must be on the wizard spell list. It must be of a level you can cast, and it must have material components costing... It can't have material components casting costing more than a 1,000 gold pieces. Once you decide on the spell, you must expend a spell slot of the spell's level. Then, to determine whether you cast the spell, make an intelligence arcana check, 10 plus the spell's level. On a successful check, you cast the spell using its normal casting time, and you can't use this property again until you finish a long rest. On a failed check, you fail to cast the spell, and a random effect occurs, determined by rolling on the following table. All right, so very much like Presto in uh, the cartoon, although Presto didn't really have much control over his hat. It just kind of, he plucked something out of it, and something happened. So now this is basically giving you access to the entire wizard's spell book, or spell list, allowing you to reach into the hat, and pull out and try to cast a level one spell you pl one plus spell you don't know. Um, it must be on the list and of a spell level you can cast. Um, and you have to spend the spell slot, so it's not a freebie. Um, and then if you make the Arcana check, right? So ten plus the spells level. So if you wanted to make a level six, pull a level six spell out of there you didn't have, you'd have to make a DC sixteen Arcana check. Pull that out of the hat. And then it's once per short or long rest you can use this. Now, the crazy part here is what happens if you fail. These are those effects. So if you roll a 0 or a 1 to 50 on your percentile roll check, uh, you cast a random spell determined by rolling a d10. 1 is an enlarge, reduce, enlarge effect. 2 is an enlarge, reduce, reduce effect. 3 is fairy fire. 4 is fireball. 5 is gust of wind. 6 is invisibility cast on yourself. 7 is Lightning Bolt, 8 is Phantasmal Force, 9 is Polymorph, 10 is Stinking Cloud. Um, do you fail to cast the spell in a random effect? Okay, so it doesn't say who you're casting the thing on, like in large reduce, like you're just casting the spell, like but on who or what. All right, 51 to 55, you have the stunned condition until the end of your next turn, believing something awesome just happened. 
56 to 60, a harmless swarm of butterflies fills a 10-foot cube within 30 feet of yourself. The swarm disperses after one minute. 61 to 65, you pull a non-magical object out of the hat. Uh, roll a d4 to determine. A vial of acid, a flask of alchemist's fire, a crowbar, or a lit torch. You suffer uh, a bout of magical sickness and have the poisoned condition for one hour. You have the petrified condition until the end of your next turn. You pull a non-magical object out of the hat. Roll a d4 again. A dagger, a rope with a grappling hook tied to the end of it, a bag of caltrops, or a gem worth 50 gold pieces. A creature randomly appears in an unoccupied space as close to you as possible. It isn't under your control and acts as it normally would, and it disappears after an hour when it drops to zero hit points. Uh, a snake, uh, sorry, a, a camel, a constrictor snake, an elephant, or a mule. A hostile swarm of bats flies out of the hat, occupies your space, and attacks you. A vertical 10-foot diameter two-way portal to another plane of existence opens in an unoccupied space within 30 feet of you and remains until the end of your next turn. The DM determines where it leads. Or 96 to 100, you pull a magic item out of the hat. Roll a d6 to determine the item's rarity. On a 1 to 3, it's a common magic item. On a 4 to 5, it's uncommon. On a 6, it's rare. The DM chooses the item, which disappears after an hour if it's not consumed or destroyed by then. Well, that's kind of a bummer, but I get it. All right, then we've got Sheila. We might also have Swarm of Bats stats. Oh, this is 2014, but there's art for it? So the camel, these are all 2024, right? But the Swarm of Bats is the 2014 Swarm of Bats, but it has art for it, which is new, I think. All right, well, whatever. Maybe the art's new. Okay, Sheila. She's going to have her Cloak of Invisibility. Oh, wait, where did I, I miss it? Okay. Is it just the Cloak of Invisibility? This cloak has three charges and regains a D3 expended charges daily at dawn. While wearing the cloak, you can take a magic action to pull its hood over your head and expend one charge to give yourself the invisible condition for one hour. The effect ends early if you pull the hood down. No action required or cease wearing the hood. Now, notice it does say this content is part of Union and the Lost Horn digital content pack. Check the marketplace for purchasing options. Let's see. Are we able to purchase this? I didn't see an option even get uni the unicorn i thought it was just a freebie thing hmm. oh well we'll have to look through because i was wondering if we could get something oh is this is this going to be like do you buy it under adventures because like i want to unlock the magic item but it's it's like right there so i don't know if you get it or it just happens automatically or whatever it is Sometimes they used to make you have to click things when you wanted to unlock it, like to get like the D and D beyond or the D and D movie items. You have to like click on a thing. Mm, I guess not. Either way, that was really exciting and really cool to go through and see all of the twenty uh, or the nineteen eighties cartoon characters updated to you know being young adults and to get to see their magic items in twenty twenty four D and D, which again is the only kind of news on magic items we've gotten outside of the player's handbook, which has basically a spell spell scroll and potion of healing is all that's in there as far as magic items go. So we just saw seven new magic items. Now cloak of invisibility isn't necessarily new. I think the cloak of invisibility did exist in the 2014 dungeon masters guide. Um, and you know, unfortunately Nico's magic item is kind of a throwaway. You know, it's just like it's a it's a mace that lets you cast a spell like anybody could come up with that. Right. It's just a mace. You pick a spell and attach it to it. Granted, it does have six charges, so you can cast six summon celestials a day. And for what it's worth, summon celestial is a fifth level spell. So it's not nothing to be nothing to sneeze at for sure. It's just not like overly um, intricate in what it can do. But either way, to see all like things like the energy bow and all these things have stat blocks is pretty wild. And more importantly, we may have new creature stat blocks, but it doesn't let me click. I'm just checking right now. Um, I do see they all have asterisks next to their name. I don't know what that means. Um, the product uses the stat blocks. Oh, yeah, it says right here. The product uses stat blocks from the 2024 Player's Handbook and the 2025 Monster Manual. The stat blocks from the Monster Manual are marked with an asterisk. Oh, as they aren't the final versions. 
So we'll do a future video on this comparing the two, but we have Blink Dog, Bugbear Warrior, Bullywug Warrior, Mage, and Warg, Bullywug, Bog Sage. Okay, so that's like a challenge rating four Bullywug and then like a challenge rating one quarter Bullywug. Okay, we'll have to do a comparison side by side. I don't know if all of them have stat blocks, but again, they are still subject to change. But anyway, uh, thank you all so much for watching. And I'll see you next time.